In the group work in this module, you've been looking at bond vibrations um, with a model that uses In the group work this week, you've been looking at the ball and spring model that can be used to describe bond vibrations as a function of the two balls on the end of a spring that can either be contracted, as in this case, or stretched, as in that case. And you should have plotted a potential energy as a function of that stretching or shrinking of the spring. And in the group work, you probably noted that at either the compressed spring position or the enlarged spring position, you have, were at a positive potential energy. And if you compressed it or stretched it by the same amount, you, were, you got the same amount of potential energy. Now at the zero position, the spring is at rest. And even if you let go of the balls at both ends, no, there's no movement. So its potential energy is zero. Now as you connected these dots, many of you may have drawn straight lines, but many of you may have thought back to your physics class what you know about springs and considered to drawing this as a um, kind of exponential curve, okay? And that's actually more correct. And so what we're going to do in this video is take our ball and spring model and a variety of different um, different calculations or formulas and build a formula that's going to let us express these bond vibrations as a function of the frequency of the bond vibration um, relative to the masses of our two different balls, or in this case, atoms. So it's going to be a little math intensive. I encourage you to grab a piece of paper and follow along. Make sure you pause this video as needed um, whenever you get a little lost or need more time in writing down a piece of the equation. Okay, so let's start with Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law um, is about restoring the force of a spring. So this is the restoring force of a spring is equal to negative ky. Here, y is the displacement of the spring. And k is a force constant. Okay. The force constant here depends on the stiffness of the spring. A stiffer spring is going to require more force to bend and compress, and so the force it will use in returning to its original position will be higher for a stiffer spring. Note that we have a negative sign here. The direction of the force is opposite the direction of the displacement, y. So when we stretch this spring out to a positive y and then let it go, the force of this spring is going to go in the opposite direction in which it was stretched. If it was compressed, again, when we let it go, it's going to spring backwards out it's from the direction it came, so we have a negative sign here. Okay, so if we're looking at potential energy, I should include Hooke's law. He's got a law, not just a book. Okay, um, if we have potential energy and we want to relate this into force, let's look at how we get potential energy and force related. First, we know that work is equal to force times distance. And we know that work is also equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. Okay. When we're dealing with these equations and these two scenarios here, we're dealing with the, um, the spring while it's still at rest, so in looking just at the potential energy. So in this case, because we're at rest before we have started any movement, our kinetic energy is zero. Okay, so now we have potential energy and we can relate this E equals force times distance or F times Y. 
And if we actually integrated this and looked at the change in energy, change in potential energy, which is what we're really interested in as a function of the change in position, we actually see this as a negative force. Again, negative because our force is in the opposite direction of the distance that we've stretched it in. Okay, So we're really looking at this equation here. Change in energy as a function of the change in the distance um, is uses the force constant. Okay, so where do we go from here? If we combine these two equations, Hooke's Law and our work equation here, we get a combined equation that says the change in energy is equal to Hooke's Law, negative ky, times a negative dy. Okay, our negatives are going to cancel each other out, so we're left with ky dy on that side. All right, now let's integrate. Okay, once we integrate, we're going to go from 0 to e here, and from 0 to y there. Okay, so we get e minus 0 equals 1 half ky squared minus 0, okay? Or e equals 1 half ky squared. Here's where we get that this equation is not linear. So when we're plotting energy as a function of, of distance or location, we can get this parabolic squared function going on because we know that this is not a squared function. All right, now how do we start comparing this or relating this to, let's say, masses of our balls, okay? What do those balls on the end of the spring have a mass of? So if we're going to start comparing a force or an energy to a mass, we might need Newton's second law. second law, okay, which says force equals mass times acceleration. And we know that acceleration is the second derivative of location and time. I encourage you to go back and review your physics um, if you've got questions about that. Okay, so we have our second derivatives there. Now, let's plug this into Hooke's Law, okay? So now we know our force is equal to negative ky. We're just using Hooke's Law again, plugging in for the force. Okay. All right, so here we are. And now we have this equation that Taking the second derivative of our constant here gives a value of the constant itself, okay? Because we've got a constant on one side and the second derivative of that constant on the other. So what kind of equations do that? Um, if you think back to calculus, our trigonometry or trigonometric equations um, will often do this. And so I'm not going to derive it for you, but we'll just kind of use what we're given and find out that d squared y over dt squared equals negative 4 pi squared nu m squared a cosine of 2 pi nu mt. Okay, so this is what our second derivative um, of y is. Okay, so now we're going to plug this in for y and d squared y dt squared. Okay, our second derivative of y is a function of t. And we're going to do a little bit of algebra, and I'm going to get a blank piece of paper just to make sure I have enough room for this. Okay. If we plug this in for both 
the derivative, second derivative, and for our y value. And then we're going to do some algebra to solve for mu m. But first, m times our negative 4 pi squared frequency squared a cosine t equals negative. We're going to combine, so we've got a negative here and a negative there. Hold on. I forgot to write what y equals. All right. So y here is a cosine 2 pi mu mt. That's important. All right, so now we're cooking with oil, and as we add the y in, we have negative ka cosine 2 pi mu m times time. All right, so we're going to do a little algebra, and we want to solve for this value. Nu here, this is the Greek letter nu, n u, okay? Um, this is representative of frequency of vibration. And that's why we're interested in this particular one. Okay, so in order to solve for this, we're going to cancel out the a's that come on both sides. We're going to cancel out our cosines that fall on both sides. We're going to cancel out our negative signs, make both of those positive. All right, and we're left with a much simpler equation. 4m pi squared mu m squared equals k. And we're going to solve for this mu m squared. which point we're going to square root both sides. And I'm going to bring these two squared values outside of it. So then it'll be 1 over 2 pi square root of k over m. Okay. So what do these values mean here? Okay. This is our natural frequency of oscillation. For our spring. Okay. K is still a spring constant. And M here is the mass of the attached bodies to the spring, or in this case, our balls. Okay. And so this works if both of the masses are the same, if both of our balls are identical. Um, but what if we're different? We'll need to take into account something a little bit different. Okay. So in this case, we'll need to do a two-body system. Let me move my paper up so you can see. A two-body system. So in this case, we're going to use reduced mass. And this is simply a way to help us combine two masses together. We're not just going to take the average specifically, but the reduced mass here is the mass of one ball times the mass of the second over the sum of the two. So it's the product of the two over the sum of the two. So. Our natural frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k times m1 plus m2 with the sum of the two masses over the product of it. So remember, we're going to sub in this reduced mass for the m. Okay. And there you have it. This is the equation that you're going to use in your group work for 
um, a variety of calculations to determine what is um, the frequency. Oh, I forgot to include one thing here. How do we get from this frequency to the, to the wave number? Because okay. wave number is what we're really particularly interested in. So in this case, wave number and frequency are related in this way. Um, a wave number, new bar, so it's the new with this little bar over top, is equal to 1 over the lambda. And again, this is called a wave number. And we know that frequency, nu, is equal to c over lambda. So combining this, we know that frequency is equal to c times wave number. So in order to convert this frequency into a wave number, which is what our FTIR is actually going to show us on the spectra, we have wave number equal to 1 over 2 pi c square root k m1 plus m2, the sum of the masses of the balls, over m1 times m2. So if you're looking for a wave number calculation, this is your, this is your uh, key, okay? Of note, single bonds are about Three have, have spring constants of 3 times 10 to the second to 8 times 10 to the second newtons per meter per single. And for double bonds, K is somewhere around 1 times 10 to the third newtons per meter. All right, so when you do this calculation, the biggest thing that I see students running into is their units don't match. So go through, figure out what a unit, unit the Newton is. Make sure you watch what unit your C is in. Make sure all of your units match up. Good luck with the rest of your group work. Please let me know if you've got any questions.